Hello friends, Huesto Enrico here, Huesto talking with famous people along with host J, host Kuirudni, host LC, host Neptune, Salty, host Kit Kats, the frustrated one, Huesto Seren, and host Sun, and a bevy of hosts tonight. Um, we're talking about SE, SI, I mean, any SE decision making. SE decision making would probably not do that, right? Would probably not decide to call everybody host all of a sudden. SE decision making would probably proceed with the existing understanding of the protocol, whatever that might be. So SE would not be happy with this format where there's no there's no really rhyme or reason to it, right? Why did I call everybody host tonight? I don't know. I just did a couple in a row and I just kept going. It's SE that caused me to make the choice in the sense that SE is why I'm not just stuck in I don't know, like in the world, I think with guys, there's a lot of false masculinity. Right. You know what I mean? Like it's like forced and like projected. Of, this is the first Where time I've heard you, by the way. Huh? This is the Who? first time I heard you. Prior to this moment, I have not heard a single thing you guys have been saying. I assumed your mic was turned off. Oh, <laughs> nope. Wait, even mine? I haven't heard anybody until this moment. Now I heard. Oh, okay. We figured you were just muted. Oh, you didn't hear me either. No. Uh, okay, well, the difference is I've been recording, so I've been recording. I've get, My end of it's been recording, but you guys, I've gotten nothing from you, so I assumed that... I'm so guys, glad that none of that was recorded. <laughs> I, I was just assuming none of you guys were saying anything. I don't know. We weren't. We were saying nothing. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> now we're talking about S-E-N-E. Jay, you were making a distinction between the two, I believe. Can you repeat that for me? Uh, I don't think I was doing that. <laughs> we were we were we're talking nice about identity. we were kind of we were talking well, we about, about the, alpha the beta dynamics in which functions come into play in a group setting that would make someone alpha or leader of the pack or any of those things. What makes someone alpha? Is that what you're asking about? Which function? Which function makes someone uh, more likely to be alpha? Naturally, not the forced kind of alpha. Um, I have a particular specific view on it. I think. Go ahead. You said you have a specific view. Tell us what it is. Yeah, like I value masculinity and wisdom over like forceful like arrogance. Like I see that as like kind of a charade in a way. Yeah, it's definitely compensatory, is that how you say the word? Compensatory, yeah. yeah. yeah there's a lot of um, like uh, I used to be in like a, a metal band. We used to play around town a lot of other metal bands and in circles like that. There's a lot of false forced masculine attitude going around it. It's just um It's manly. It's there's manly. a lot of that. Jay, it's manly. And then you have like a Hollywood. Say what? I said it's very manly, admit it. What is? Forced masculinity. Um I don't think so. I think if you look down at the mechanism that wants to project that, it's there's like a deficit there somewhere in a person. Somewhere. What do those projections look like? What does it look like when someone is forcing a projection of masculinity? Uh, I guess um, there's even like terms like, like is it Hemingway syndrome? He used to be dressed up as a, his mom used to dress him up as a, a girl when he was younger. This is an extreme example, but his mom used to dress him up as a, in girls clothes when he was younger. And then when, he got older, you know, he's kind of 
famous for being this like brute, risk taking, not like doesn't fear death at all kind of war hero character, you know. And it was all just compensation because he felt like he had to prove his masculinity because of his childhood. Right. Mom treated me like a girl, so now I'm a badass. Well, that's a, that's one reason why it could happen, but obviously there's other reasons why someone could feel emasculated in childhood and then feel the need to make up for it, right? Sure. I mean, I I think that says it explains a lot about my own expressions of uh, yeah, fuck you or whatever, uh, in the sense that that I. I feel as though, you know, my my childhood, certain sections of it were spent dealing with unjust hierarchy things. And so, as a consequence, I carry that into adulthood as a point of emphasis. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm necessarily consumed with with damage from it or something it just means that it framed my understanding of interpersonal relationships and of, of what one ought to be concerned about regarding those relationships you know if, if you grew up in an environment where the adults around you were very ineffective at at giving you any sort of clear direction well then you're probably gonna have that as a uh, fixating point as you get older. For me, it was more like the adults around me were ineffective at conveying um, conveying that they they got they got the justice shit handled. Right, the kids were were allowed to abuse each other in unacceptable fashion, and that's what I grew up witnessing in school and in on the streets and stuff, because we were all left unsupervised, you know? And so are you saying that you were not a fan of roughhousing, and you were kind of at the bottom of the doggy pile? Or... I mean, my my status varied depending on groups, subgroups, stuff like that. And where I landed depended on what I was doing. But yeah, basically I'm saying... Uh, what I determined was that regardless of what I was doing, I didn't like being humiliated. And I found that the the shaming of others was a tool that was used carelessly by a lot of people. And I determined to use it properly. So I'm not, I am not opposed to shaming people. I'm opposed to shaming people who deserve to be shamed. Because the alternative is coercive... Con uh, outcomes that I'm not comfortable with either. What does that, how, how does that relate to masculinity? Well, I mean, masculinity in my understanding of the word <laughs> as a human being, not as some sort of, of official psychological definition or whatever, but my understanding of the word masculinity is to the extent that I feel as though uh, my will has the capacity to affect change that my agency is manifest in the world and that people people push back for good reasons only you know i i don't like pushback that's based on me so if i ever get pushback that says oh no we can't do that because it's your thing and you're bad at that or you're you're inadequate in some way. That kind of stuff tends to make me angry. So I don't mind people saying that's a bad idea because X, Y, and Z. If they can't answer those questions adequately though, and they still say it's a bad idea, then I start thinking that, that they may have some wrongness that I need to thrash, you know? Because they're opposing me for no good reason. And you're saying that's like a hierarchy thing? That if they're opposing me for no good reason, they must view me as fundamentally less than, or or greater than them, and they're trying to uh, prove otherwise. Yeah, I, like I, I, thus far, I find, un, I find myself unable to believe that part. I, Why? I don't know. It runs deep. 
You know, I just, I don't believe myself uh, fundamentally. I, I'm not at risk, ultimately, of being conceited deep down. I may be at risk of sometimes behaving in a conceited fashion if I am. You don't have to be conceited to be uh, intimidating now. Some people have said I'm intimidating. I don't know what to make of that. Uh, I'm intimidating to people who <clears throat> are fucking with me. If if they're fucking with me for no reason, it's not me being intimidating. It's their wrongness that's causing them to feel intimidated because all I'm doing is shoving it in their face. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, that's how I feel about it anyway, is... I don't feel like I'm intimidating because I don't have any problems with anybody unless unless they're they're maybe you're so scary that nobody starts problems with you. Well, <laughs> I'm I just mean, kidding. It's not possible to, have to start problems with me unless you're pulling some bullshit, in which case my reaction to it is not anything other than what everyone's reaction to it should be, which is uh no. <laughs> No and no and no and and you better stop. If you don't, I feel like um give me some more no's and they get only worse. I feel like our um our masculinity alpha conversation kind of got derailed at some point. I don't know where it like fell off, but well, we're continuing it right now. I mean, I, I went through a deep. period of time where I would have where I would have liked to have been perceived as alpha male. Where I tended to view those kind of equations as binary like that, but um, I don't think I do anymore because I think I've had the opportunity to to embrace that role if I wanted to and found myself unable and uninterested in doing so. Unable to embrace it, I'm willing to embrace it, uninterested in embracing it. It just doesn't work for me. It doesn't. It doesn't give me any juice, you know. I think media actually uh, has sort of, I don't know, like halfway created that kind of like the perception of when we think of the word alpha male and stuff like that. Yeah, and even the opposite, like femininity, like. That's yeah. why some, some people are it's, like, oh, like this function is particularly effeminate yeah. or whatever. Yeah, people internalize it. Yeah. At least it means that way because like the, the, the Hollywood stigma of an alpha male is like riddled with pro like problems. It's like incredibly stubborn, prone to uh, anger, uh, complete lack of compassion uh, or empathy, very much so like an island of a person ethics mm -hmm. on his terms that's the problem with the conventional understanding of the alpha male it's ethics on his terms oh he's a good guy on you know is the best you're going to say about him and it's going to be on his terms gets in fights at the bar you know that kind of that kind of a deal can't handle his anger when drinks man just golly <laughs> getting in trouble with the cops I mean, you know what I mean? That kind of stigma, it's like stigmatizing. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, here's the thing, though. What I think is a reality that can be frustrating for people who are, who are less um, naturally reproductively viable. You know, for there's obviously a, a range of of qualities that interplay into making one reproductively viable. And there are those who experience the life of highly reproductively viable individuals early on, and that's going to shape people a lot, versus if you experience the life of somebody who's not very reproductively viable, then that's going to shape your experience a lot too. Being in the latter camp, being in the latter camp makes me... Saying that are you talking about people who are ugly? Well, I'm saying that for whatever reason, they aren't, they don't participate in the teenage years actively in the dating kind of thing. 
and uh -huh. they're either excluded from it or they exclude themselves or for any number of reasons they come out of adolescence with issues related to that now if there are some people who are who limit themselves and or who are limited by family circumstances and stuff like that that it has nothing to do with their their desirability or their their success should they put themselves out there so to speak you know um it's that kit cats you're saying you never participate in any of that kind of stuff that doesn't mean you're not reproductively viable and i don't think you have any issues about it like you're not thinking to yourself oh i'm never going to find somebody who will be interested in me that's probably not a concern of yours i'm guessing but for a lot of us, it is a concern when we leave adolescence and we find the whole matter scary, you know, it's for me, it was something that I just wanted to, I wanted to lock it down so I wouldn't have to worry about it anymore. And, uh, that obviously is not a good strategy for finding a lasting relationship that works well. Well, why? Because it's it's the stuff I don't do well, right? It's FI and it's SI to a certain extent. Keeping track of shit like her birthday and you know stuff like that. And so I just wanted to lock that shit down. Um, <laughs> her birthday, stuff like that. Corey's birthday is really easy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, what a tragedy. <laughs> so, um, you know, <laughs> and the thing is, I've had two marriages, right? I've been married twice. The second one lasted quite a while. I was with her for a long time. I don't, there's nothing left for me to prove in terms of my reproductive viability. I have a child, an 18 year old daughter. I have successfully reproduced, <laughs> you know. Um, Why does that even matter? Well, well, if you have some kind of issue, with, that's kind of what I'm getting at here. Is it? I'm talking to somebody who's more or less on the other side of that, while still not being, not ever having become the alternative to it, which is somebody who's who's confident and comfortable in that area. So I can say that I'm, I'm past. I'm past any major insecurities about it. Being 45 years old, I've been married twice, having a daughter, stuff like that. I don't really worry about whether or not I'm I'm particularly uh, desirable to chicks, right? It's not a it's not a major concern of mine. It is an area that I still have to address, though, because like I am looking to eventually get a mate. I want to make sure I get the right mate, though. It's got to be probably an ISFJ. If shit falls in my lap between now and getting the right mate, then great, shit falls in my lap and I'll, I'll, I'll do with things in my lap what one does to things in one's lap. And that's fine. But my point is, uh, you know, I, I'm still basically in the same mindset of looking to solve that problem uh, so that I don't have to return to it again not looking to solve that problem for right now because I enjoy solving that problem on a regular basis with various solutions to that problem, you know? And, and this, this relates uh, to the masculinity thing because you're saying that it, people who are performing their masculinity, it's uh, because they're trying to be, uh, <clears throat> they try, they're trying to like attract a mate basically is what well, you're saying? Well, I'm saying that that the alpha male model of the individual going out and preferring in, in sort of like an ideal, in an ideal alpha male world, there's a preference for having an endless series of, of dalliances with an endless series of chicks. But I'm saying, I don't want that. And it took me a long time to understand that it's okay to not want that. That in fact, that it's fine to be somebody who's engaged in serial monogamy uh, if you're uh, now obviously there's a friendship thing that is is separate from that Kit Kats that 
I yeah, I'm aware of the fact that I can have most of my needs met with non-intimate relationships. The vast majority of them. But there what it boils down to is not about the the sexual intercourse. It's about the fact that when you're in a one-on-one -on -one monogamous relationship, you have a life partner to whom you report and who reports to you. You have somebody you can share <laughs> You have a parole officer? That's, that's <laughs> you have somebody who, with whom you can share your life successes unfiltered, not having to worry about how you're being perceived, right? You can actually discuss things directly without worrying about perceptions. You can have somebody to share and shoulder your challenges in life so that you're not carrying them alone and you're not carrying them by a, some less lockdown relationship. The whole point of a committed monogamous relationship, from my perspective, is that it's to work as a pair rather than as a solo person. And it affords you certain comforts and certain reliable states of being that help address some of the native vulnerability of being a mortal human in the world. Um, and they also constrain you in certain ways. So I understand that for me, single bachelor and not sexually active is a viable option but it's probably one I'm gonna at least chafe against for a while until I determine it's a necessary outcome rather than just a viable option In other words, it's not my preferred course of action if I can find the right significant other and in fact I got a reply a little while ago from an earlier message I sent to this girl's um, showing promise here on tinder we've exchanged some messages that well, you said girl me, does that imply that she's uh, a little bit younger than you no i use the word for 60 year old women or 70 year old women if i wanted to but uh it, she is younger than me she's 34. Mm -hmm. she loves avocados ceramics Pilates and so much more. I would definitely not swipe uh, right, but <laughs> well, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm sure she's great. It's a little great. more complicated. It's interesting you talking about all this, like a uh, reproductive perspective, uh, evolutionary mating stuff because I'm like so outside of that because of uh, you know my sexuality and stuff so it's kind of like interesting hearing it like I always thought that the ideal situation was I want to perform my masculinity and I want a girl who's going to perform femininity and then we can live happily ever after but that's because I'm stupid and I think that straight people are um, more simple than they actually are um, yeah, I mean, I do think that, uh, I mean, I, I tend to want a female who's comfortable with, with more of a feminine role in the sense that, I mean, I, I like, I like a lot of mothering from my significant other in general. That comes from being an NTP, though. In, in, NTPs seek help in, in areas that make them seem infantile. Each Do you have them, mommy issues because you're an NT, or are you an NT because you have mommy issues? I'm, I'm kidding. You probably don't have mommy issues. But. What I'm saying is that because I've got SI in the fourth slot, FI in the seventh, I need help with organizing my things and knowing how I feel. So, you know, that means I'm going to seek a certain amount of mothering from a significant other. And an INTP needs help with, um, you know, knowing how, <laughs> knowing how other people are made to feel by their actions. And remember to tie your shoes. Remember to blah, blah, blah. Remember to do the basic things that you got to do in life. Remember to take a shower. 
You know, INTPs need that. So, <laughs> that's so true. I haven't showered in legit five days. Like, it's I, kind I, of hey, gross. that's good for you, man. I, I, I'm shower. I'm. I live a shower fluid life. Liss life. I live a shower fluid life. <laughs> sometimes I take a lot of showers. Sometimes not take so many showers. I'm shower fluid. I take hey, it when I'm like. I take them off when I'm like really, really depressed, and then I like wait till the hot water runs out. I'm pretty sure that everyone does that, but and I almost never stand in the shower. I just sit in it. <laughs> I used to sit <laughs> in the shower. Yeah. I like to sit in the shower. My mom's an ISFJ. I kind of like the water so hot that it burns me a little bit. <laughs> what did you say? <coughs> I, I'm just like kind of trolling. I have a, a very nuanced relationship with water temperature in the shower. It, it varies during moments of the shower. Sometimes when I want it almost as hot as it can possibly be, almost too hot to stand. Other times, and once I'm reach a certain temperature, is that because you're trying to kill the pain, the, the emotional pain? Now I'm trying to kill the the itch. There's an itchiness that happens when you hit yourself with hot water. That then resolves its own itchiness with more hot water. It's not really itchy. It's like underneath the skin itchy. Nobody else has Interesting. that Interesting. Huh? No, no, I think I'll, I'll have to try to it's take a shower and find on out. The, <laughs> on the butt and the back of the legs, that's where you have that itch experience when you hit it with the hot water. And you go, I, 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 like that. Can I take that sample and loop it and turn it into a song? You should. I took samples from Cat <laughs> and made them into a song. That's the sound I make in the shower when I did the hot water on the back of my legs and it makes that itchy. I, really <laughs> I bite my tongue at the same time. It's called Rai Rai. Delilah knows what it is too. She has it as well. Rai Rai is the ENTP's relationship with SI when it's, when it's in its most basic form of like being warm when it's cold or uh, being lying down when you're tired. That's... That's the feeling of Rai Rai. I heard that millennials dislike using bars of soap more so than previous generations. I like bars of soap. I dislike <laughs> non-bar soap. You're not a you're not a millennial. That's fine. I dislike not having a bar soap option. I appreciate having multiple soap options in the shower, but not as many soap options as chicks want to have. Chicks want to have like 70 different kinds of shampoos. <laughs> Why aren't you guys talking courtly? They're playing... They're I don't playing. have anything to add to this conversation. You guys don't have any experience with showers. I don't believe that. <laughs> no, never showered. They're good to, to take them. I love showers. I mean, whatever you want me to be, I want you to not to be not better than me. So that is so snappy, Kit Kats. That is fucking snappy. <laughs> That's a snappy retort. You are chock full of snappy retorts. I just wanted to give a shout out to that snappy retort there, Kit Kats. He's talking to the guy. You're going to snap his neck into with snappy retorts like that. Um, okay. So. Yeah, well, that's where you get the snappy retorts from. What's that's the that's age <laughs> Oh, you're you're a chick. I'm better than you. Okay, you gotta snap her neck with your snappy retorts. It. Listen, I'm better than you. You don't get to make gender claims with if you don't go on camera. Why? Because I don't accept the central thesis of the notion of gender fluidity. Because I don't think that you get to choose your gender. I think that other people choose your gender. 
You think other people choose your gender, you said? Yeah, if the only reason gender is relevant at all is for other people, not for yourself. That's not true. Like, when I put makeup on, when I put makeup on at home, it's because I feel more comfortable doing that, and I'm, like, performing an aspect of gender, but it's not for other people, it's just for me. Okay, but that doesn't make I feel you more a woman. comfortable in my own skin that but way. But that doesn't make you a woman. I didn't say that, but I'm saying that <laughs> if a woman were to do that at home, um, or let me rephrase this. Let's see. I'm not saying you can't engage in gender, gender negative <laughs> behaviors for whatever reason. I'm saying no. you don't get to choose whether you are perceived as a man or a woman. And that to the extent that it's anything other than a chromosomal issue, that's what it is. There's a, Well, there's the term perceived gender, and then there's actual gender. And that's where the word dysphoria comes into play, because people don't perceive you the way you actually are, what your gender actually is. So gender is definitely a, a personal thing. But what's not your a... gender, no, what's your, there's, there's sex, right? Your sex is chromosome determined, correct? Correct. Your gender is something you might make aspirational claims about, but your claims are false until and unless verified by the perceptions of others. If others perceive you as a woman, you are a woman. If others perceive you as a man, you are a man. If others perceive you as a man attempting to present himself as a woman, then that's what you are gender-wise. You don't get to self-determine gender. You will, you will gender. deal with issues anything. of what people perceive you as, but that doesn't mean that that's your gender. Like saying that. So if we started acknowledging you as a woman, you'd be like, oh, well, I guess I'm a woman now. Well, put it the other way. If I claimed persistently I was Chinese, you might humor me, you'd never actually agree and believe me. I think the trans uh, racial argument is a little... Correct? A little too powerful? I agree. Uh, maybe a little uh, controversial. There's nothing controversial about it at all. It's exactly the same thing. To the extent that race has any reality to it at all, it has as much reality to it as gender. Not like sex. Sex is actually a real thing. Gender is a make-believe construct that is as worthless and divisive as the concept of race. Oh, no, I definitely 100% believe it's a social construct, but deciding where you fit in, I believe that you can decide where you fit in to gender. Like I said, you can make those claims, but our only falsification methodology for, for gender is the perceptions of others. We don't have but say, So you're saying that gender. someone else's perception of you is more valid than your own perception of yourself, which is really troubling to people who are experiencing no, trans I, I'm dysphoria. I can perceive myself as being clean-shaven as much as I want. Falsification of that claim requires me to acknowledge that I'm not. <clears throat> And I'm not because I don't determine whether or not I have a beard by evaluating my own feelings about it or my own perceptions of myself. I evaluate whether or not I have a beard by seeking actual sources of data. Like, hey, do I have a beard? I, I don't think this will be a very productive conversation, but I could, I'll get back to you with... Uh, I'm giving you truth. How could it not be productive when I'm telling truths? It's sort of... It's just controversial because I don't necessarily agree with it, but I have to, like, I'm trying to process what you're saying, but it's, like, computing in a very weird way. So I'm, I'm trying to just digest it, and then I'll get back to you on it. Okay. Sorry, I was slipping into uh, fight mode there. Just because. I feel like this is a particularly sensitive topic. See, I don't yeah, like that's why I'm topic. trying to be particularly like tactful. And that's why that I don't makes me want to be like... less tactful about it. I don't like tact about sensitive topics. I like beating the shit out of them so they realize that they need to be less sensitive. Well, we differ in that regard. I can't really relate with the gender identity issue because I've never had experienced any kind of identity issue in that regard. 
And I doubt that you have too, Eric. It's, so how would you understand? I understand it to be a matter of of for ENTPs, what if you're going through an identity issue like that or trying to define yourself clearly as this or that or the other thing, then if you're doing anything dramatic, you're making a mistake because you don't know how you feel about it. You don't remember who you are. You've got shitty SI and you've got blind spot with your own feelings. That's not the Myers sort of thing Briggs you should aside, endeavor though, we... to undertake. What? Myers-Briggs aside, though, uh, gender in general we're talking about. Right. And not, say, not gender for an ENTP, just look, gender in general. If I, let's say I tried to genuinely do a transracial thing where I was actually going around trying to convince people for some reason to actively think of me as Chinese. First of all, most people would say, Eric, I'm not actively thinking about your race at all. You know, um, you two could be a little bit distracting with your constant playing around when I'm, we're trying to talk about shit, you know? You're laughing at your statement. Courtney, <laughs> God damn it. Your dissembling is not helpful either. Now, um, the point is, if I were to go around and try, no, I want you to treat me like a Chinese person. Well, my first thing would be like, well, first of all, I try to treat everybody the same, even Chinese people, right? That would be my first response to it. Why do you insist that I make this distinction at all regarding you? I try not to in dealing with people I try not to treat Courtney different because she's a chick, right? I try not to treat you different because you're a dude. I try to treat everybody the same. I try not to treat kids different because they're younger. I try not to treat old people different because they're older. And so that's problem number one with the actually going around trying to convince people to, come on, no, really treat me like a Chinese person. That's problem number one. Problem number two with it is, even if I convince them to behave as though I'm Chinese, at no point is any Buddy going to actually see me as Chinese. I am burdening them by saying, behave differently than your actual perceptions because I'm choosing to try to dictate that which is your possession, namely your perceptions of me. I understand those points, yeah. Now, you can change people's perceptions of you, but you have to do it indirectly. And that's not how gender is dealt with ever. I don't gradually come to think of a transgender person as a woman because there's a time magic being used by them on me, which is how it should be done. In that case, I'm not going to notice it. If I'm noticing it, it's because they are doing the worst possible thing, which is confronting my perception with a coercion saying, I expect to be perceived as this and for you to behave as though I'm perceived as this, even though you don't perceive me as this, and I am placing upon you some claim of ethical high ground. That is, then there's fighting words because in fact, you have the ethical low ground. You're the one making the presumption to burden me with changing my behavior and my perceptions that aren't concurrent with your self-identity. But your self-identifying about something that doesn't possess by the individual, possesses by the perceiver. And so your claim upon my mental processes is a claim of ownership, sir. And I hereby reject it. Yeah, that was a really good argument. Anybody want to respond to it? I'm trying to fix transgenderism. Nobody wants to touch that with a 10-foot pole. Thanks for watching Talk with Fence, people.